Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Bear with me a second. You've caught me in the middle of being rather busy in the background, so to speak. Look, this, this machine is not being used internally, it's being used over the back there, where I'm trying to determine how I can get my beam to stay as small as possible over the whole of the work table. Now, this is a carry on from the last couple of sessions where I'm hunting for something that basically everybody calls it a beam expander. But an expander means that you take the beam and you make it bigger. There is also something called a collimator, which means you take a beam and you try and make it parallel. And in essence, that's what a beam expander is. It both expands the beam so that it can be collimated. You cannot collimate a beam, according to Lenz theory, unless you expand it. But on the other hand, the laws of laser beams clearly tells me that if I make the beam bigger, I reduce its intensity. I have two problems with that. Number one, I'm reducing the cutting capability of the little 30 watts that I've got here. And secondly, the device that's supposed to be a beam expander, two times beam expander, doesn't do a very good job. That's nothing to do with the design. It's been designed perfectly for use as a telescope or a camera or a microscope, but not as a means of controlling a laser beam because laser beams operate with completely different rules. Lens theory, as with all theories, has boundaries. Those boundaries are artificially put there to make sure that you stay within the calculation boundaries. It's an excuse for saying, look, you can't go outside these boundaries because if you do, the rules don't apply. So what you see me doing is working outside those boundaries. There are no rules out here. So I'm going to demonstrate to you today what I'm doing. There are no calculations. There are no ray diagrams involved because I haven't got a bloody clue how the rays are working. All I do is look at the end result. I don't predict what the end result is. I'm only interested in the end result. And what I'm finding so far clearly tells me that I'm on the right track. If I keep the beam small and don't take its intensity away, I can make this machine perform like a 60 watt machine, even though it's only a 30 watt tube, because I understand how laser cutting actually works. Now, I'm not going to involve you in all these hundreds of tests that I've been doing with these little acrylic blocks. Basically these are mode burns, hundreds and hundreds of mode burns, because the only way that you can see the intensity in a laser beam is to let it burn into a block of acrylic and evaporate the acrylic. It produces a 3D image of the beam intensity and its diameter. Now, I am having some success here. I wouldn't say I'm gonna win first prize, but you know, my goal was to finish up with double the power over the whole of this table. In other words, I want 60 watts cutting capacity over the whole of this table. I might finish up with 60 watts cutting capacity over most of the table, because I don't think I should be able to get right into the corners of the table and I'll explain that a little bit later on. But what I want to do to start with is just explain the method by which I'm trying to achieve the results that I'm trying to achieve. As I said, acrylic is my master tool. It's the thing that allows me to look at what's happening to the laser beam. Now you've seen some of those tests in the previous video, so I'm not gonna go through those. But in this session, I've given up on this two times. And one of the great things about this is that it is adjustable and I can accurately set up this gap here. Now, I've been playing with all sorts of lens combinations. I've only got two of these little concave lenses. These are Plano concave, okay? And these are the first lens that sits in the front. They always have the concave side outwards. When this was supplied, it was supplied with the concave side inwards. It's really strange that you would think that a Plano concave lens would make a huge difference to the performance if you turned it over. 
In fact, this one in here is the wrong way round. Well, it's not the wrong way round. It's the way, it's the way round that it was originally supplied. In here, we've got a times two initial concave lens. I don't know what the focal length of it is or how to even define the focal length of a concave lens. But that's what I finished what that's what I finished up with in there and I'll draw you a picture of what I finished up with in a minute and at the front here I've got a two and a half inch Plano convex gallium arsenide lens I've tried all sorts of lenses in the front here and the only ones that seem to work are the gallium arsenide lenses if I replace that with a Plano convex zinc selenide lens it's absolute junk well I say a junk <laughs> It doesn't give me what I'm looking for. Let me just show you very quickly how I go about testing. I don't waste a great deal of time doing these mode burns initially. There's a much quicker way for me to assess what's going on with the beam. And I'm just going to demonstrate that to you. Let me just loosen this off. So here's what I'm using for doing my test work. Basically, thin brown card. Now all I'm going to do, look, I've got a block of acrylic here, which I have been using from time to time for doing tests in, as you can see. I take that card to that block, and then I stand that block on a tripod. So I'm going to be able to adjust this backwards and forwards by a significant amount. The first thing I do is put my lenses in there, and I don't know whether I'm anywhere near what I want, so what we do is this. So we turn the machine on, and we'll just give it a quick blip. Not impressive, is it? Just a, a mark. So we can make the flip a little bit longer. And look, we've got a very large diameter beam. So let me pull the lens forward a little bit. Move this across the shade. And we'll try another one. And there we go. Look, we're already starting to focus the beam. Pull it forward a little bit more. It's getting even smaller. Keep going. Now, there was something else happened there now. Okay. Now, I'll just do one more. Let's bring those into the light, into a different light, so that you can have a look at what's actually happened there. You can see that I can get a lot of information very quickly from this test. First of all, this one is a large diameter and it's scorched. So there's not much intensity in that beam because it's only scorching. I had to hold that beam on quite a long time to get it to scorch that much. Then I increased the focal length and it made the beam smaller. I increased the focal length again and it made it even smaller. I can feel it, it's just beginning to lose its centre and I increase the focal length even more and now I've made the beam smaller and as I make the beam smaller look the central intensity in the beam is sufficient to actually burn right through the card now if we take a look here it's quite a large hole with quite a significant burn around the outside the halo the brown halo around the outside now this is a smaller burn and a smaller halo so the beam has become much more intensified here than it was here than it was here or here or here so I've got a very quick visual reading of the beams power and diameter it's not quite 400 but basically what I'm going to be doing is measuring the distance away from the lens to do each of my tests. You may remember last time I showed you this very brief schematic of the machine and what I said that there was roughly 80 mil between here and the end of the um, expander to the first mirror then about 200 then about 100 then about 100 down to the lens so there was roughly something like 480 millimeters there was almost 500 millimeters of non-usable beam length before we got to the table and it was only when we got to the table which moved 300 by 500 where I had 800 millimeters of working beam length because I've now increased the length of my beam expander 
my collimator, my beam conditioning system, I don't know what you want to call it, I've just removed 100 millimeters from this dead path. I've got my beam expander 400 millimeters away. Previously, it would have been 500 millimeters away to take into account this beam path here, 500 millimeters. But because I've increased this, I've now reduced this dead area to 400. 400 plus the 800 for the table takes me out to 1200 millimeters. And in between that, midway between those two is 800 millimeters. And I put a further two divisions in there, one at 600 and one at 1000. And I'm testing over that range there at the moment because this last little bit here I found is nearly impossible to get any sensible results. The beam is pretty rubbish as it gets towards the end, these end two points. Basically what I've been doing is setting this up to the midpoint which is about 800 millimeters. I've been trying to achieve a nice small compact beam at this center of the table position. So as you can see I've moved that from 400 to 800 now and the beam has changed. Now I've reset the focus and look what I've got. I've got a really really small high intensity beam because you can't see that but most of that black that you see in there as a hole through the middle there's virtually no halo through the middle. So it's a very very powerful beam. So now let's move it another 200 millimeters and away. We'll take a look what's happened to this teeny weeny little beam at a thousand millimeters. It's still not big. There's a hole with a halo around the outside now but that is still a very very intense beam. So now we come back to the other extreme which is 600 millimeters. That is bigger than that but it's about the same sort of size as that one to have a set of lenses in here at the moment which I've been working with and established the best set of conditions but this is how I've been going about it. I then set my blocks up on here at those three positions and gently keep fiddling with the focus until I get the best 3D conditions. I know that my best gap in here was 23.5 so we'll just set this to 23.5. I've modified my gap to 23.5 and that is a thousand millimeter. We'll now do 800. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's 600. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. Well, they're getting pretty balanced now. I don't think I can get much better than that. So between 600 and 800 millimetres travel on the table, I should have very, very good cutting. OK, now after a few days of playing with this beam expander, I don't think I really ought to call it a beam expander anymore. I think I'm going to call it a beam conditioner. In the diagram that I showed you earlier, I described the various positions on the table because the first 400 millimetres or so are unimportant as far as the beam is concerned. So here's what the beam looks like at 400 millimetres. 600, 800, 1000 and then the other extreme of the table is 1200. Now, as you can see, at 1200 and 400 the penetration is not brilliant. In fact I think it's better than the standard two times but look at what we've done between 1000 and 600 which is the central area of the table. This is the beam straight out of the tube and in fact at 800 if we look at the cone at the bottom here you'll see that that cone there is probably smaller than when it came straight out the tube. So that's a higher intensity than what we had straight out the tube. I've amplified the intensity. At 1,600, we've got fabulous intensity. So I'm very, very confident that this machine will really do some serious cutting in this central area. Now, what that means is I'm going to have to very carefully arrange my table. So my table is 500 by 300. 
And basically what I've done here is marked out a little pattern which says inside this green zone here is where I've got that high intensity and I'm losing the intensity at the corners. So when I test this machine, I've got to make sure I test it in this area here to see what the maximum cutting is. We'll also check what's happening at the corners and compare that to how it was originally about a year ago when I tested it the first time. I've got all sorts of focal length lenses at this end that I can play with. I only had two of these zinc selenide primary optics to work with. They were both Plano concave. One was from a times two beam expander and the other was a times three beam expander. They are slightly different but I finished up using the times two beam expander. That was the one that gave me the best combination, the best results that you've just seen. And then I added a two and a half inch gallium arsenide lens with the, and you can hardly see it on here, but it is the convex face, this side, a plain side, that side. Now the results are absolutely staggering. Not quite as perfect as I'd hoped, but then again, I have a limitation on the lenses that I can use. As I've indicated to you before, I have a degree in optical ignorance. I know very little about optics. Enough to get me by. Let's call it ankle deep. I know enough to be able to draw a ray diagram using Snell's law of refraction. As the light passes in and out of these surfaces, so there's refraction taking place. And the refractive index of each of these materials is different. And I've also taken into account the fact that the beam which enters here, supposedly a two millimeter beam, but I know in reality that it comes out closer to four millimeters. I've drawn a four millimeter beam input with the right angle because it's got to have a seven millirad expansion built into it, which means there's a very small angle on that beam there. And then what I've done, I've used the central two millimeters and that's what I've drawn. I've drawn the high intensity part of the beam to see if I could find out if it matched what I could see with those results there. So there's my seven millirad expansion of the beam so that I could copy that to make the input angle correct down here. And then when it comes out, the first 400 millimeters is not used. So I don't really care what's happening to that part of the beam because it's just dead. What I'm really interested in is what happens when it gets onto the table, which is between here and here. So that's where my 400, 600, 800, 1000 and 1200 millimeter measurement points came in to see what was happening. As you can see from this ray diagram, that there is no focus. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it gets towards the other side of the table. You've seen that this is not what's happening. We're getting a narrowing of the beam from here and down to here and back out to slightly bigger again. So there's some sort of focus there. I hate to use the word focus because I don't think it is focus. It's an increase in the intensity of the beam, which is happening here. And that intensity has got nothing to do with the apparent diameter of the beam. Is that making sense? No, it isn't making sense. Because ray tracing tells me that I can't get what, I, what you've just seen me get. Do I care? Not really. I'm interested in what the beam is doing, not what it's theoretically supposed to do. So it's getting a bit late now, so I'm going to have to leave that till tomorrow when we'll do some more cutting tests, we'll see exactly what that beam can now do. Well, here we are, another day, another cup of coffee. Um, it's a very, very windy day out there, so you may hear some strange noises in the background. Now, before we start these tests, I need some references. So what I've done, I've taken some power readings at various points around the machine that you didn't need to watch me do, and looked at the power coming straight out of the RF unit. And the answer was 35.6 watts. I also then checked right in the center of the machine, the power at the table after it had been through three mirrors. And the answer was 31.6 watts. I then put the beam conditioning unit in and did the same check down at the table to see what the watts were down at the table. Now, typically from previous work that I've done on lenses and mirrors, 
I know that there is somewhere between a 3 and a 4% loss per mirror or lens. They're roughly about the same. So on average, what I've said is, let's assume we've got 3.5% loss per element. Okay, well here we've got one, two, three elements, and that gives us a reduction from 35.6 to 31.8, which more or less agrees with what I measured. And similarly here, we've added another two lenses into the system. So it's now one, two, three, four, five, lots of 3.5% losses. Forget the compounding, just take it as a simple, straightforward calculation. Um, and the result comes out at 30.1 watts. I don't think there's anything wrong with the system. I think it's doing exactly what we'd normally expect. So I've got 30, roughly 30 watts down here to play with. Okay, so the next question is, what does the beam look like at this point here? And just to remind you, here's what the beam looked like when it came straight out of the RF source. Here's what it was like when we focused it down through that beam conditioner. That's at the centre of the table. So we've got incredibly high intensity here and also at 1,000 millimetres and 600 millimetres. It's only right at the front and the rear corners of the machine where we've got this loss of intensity. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So that was a test without the mirrors in a straight line straight out the tube. And this is my test after three mirrors. But there is maybe bigger diameter. Maybe I'll measure that and see what we get. And there's the answer. Roughly five millimetres for both of them, but this one is slightly elliptical. So we've still got the very sharp beam that I expected right in the centre of the table there. Now in here I've got a two inch gallium arsenide lens, the one that I've been using most of the time. On the other machine I've done a focus test on it and it tells me that the best focus here is at about six millimetres and I've measured that line there to be roughly 0.2 millimetres wide and as you can see the focus changes quite dramatically as I move away from that very very single point there. Now I don't have the same programmable Z on this machine so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to drop the lens to say two millimetres three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we'll see what happens as we run from three to eight, the same test that we've just done there. Now, that's a surprise in two ways. First of all, you'll note how brown these lines are and how black these lines are. Same material, obviously same lens, completely different beam into the lens itself. Look at the diameter of these. Between 3 and 11 millimetres, between 3 and 10 millimetres, we've got no change in the width of that line. And it only went up 0.1 when we got between 11 and 13. I mean, that is a phenomenal change in that lens performance because of the way in which we've conditioned the input beam. I can immediately see that because we've got a much bigger beam here than we had here, that this is not going to be very good at cutting. A 0.6 diameter kerf is going to make this pretty crap at cutting. Look at the depth of focus, if you want to call it that. The working range of that lens has gone from less than one millimeter up to about seven millimeters. We need to do some more experiments, don't we? The reason why the other set weren't brown was because I didn't have any air assist on. Now I'm blowing the crap down back onto the job. But look, 0.7 all the way from two millimeters up to 13 millimeter. What is going on? I mean, it's almost as though this lens is not focusing. The beam is passing straight through the lens. I suspect that if I change the cutting speed, that line thickness will drop quite dramatically. So if I change that to say 400 from 25, let's see what happens. 
Well that was 400 millimetres a second and the line dropped to 0.5 millimetres wide. I've now pushed the power up to 100% and the speed up to 800. So look, I've got this set as high as 18 millimetres now and at 99% power, full power and 800 millimetres a second. I still can't get the line thickness to go below 0.5. It is stuck at 0.5 over the whole of that range. So the slower I go, the thicker it gets, but I can never not get it thinner than 0.5. So it's almost as though the middle of that lens is just not focusing. But that's not unreasonable in a strange sort of way. Gallium arsenide lens is a much flatter lens than the equivalent zinc selenide. So what we'll do, we'll swap this over now for a two inch zinc selenide lens and compare the difference in performance. Well, I'm seeing a little bit of a pattern here at the moment in that we've got two inch gallium arsenide, regardless of which way it is, it's 0 0.6 or 0 0.7, 0 0.7. We've got a two inch zinc selenide, which is generally 0.6 going down, this zinc selenide one and a half is going even thinner lines. We're down at 0.5 here, so it's 0 0.7, 0.7 and 0 0.6, 0 0.6 and 0.5. Now I could push down and try the one inch ones, but what I'm going to do now, I'm going to actually test my very, very short focal length compound lens, which is about 21 millimetres focus, which is even shorter than this one, but because it's a compound lens, it's got some very strange properties. So let's test the compound lens and see what how that reacts to this very silly input. This compound lens normally has a distance here. I use it somewhere in the region between 10.5 and 11.5, and it shows on here the best focus on the other machine at 11 millimetres with a line thickness of 0.1. On this machine, that short focal length lens is having a significant effect on the line thickness. Look, it goes from thick through to thin. Okay, so it's over a wide range of 5 to 15 mil. But even so, somewhere here, around about 11, 12 millimetres, it drops down to about 0.2 line thickness. Now, that's pretty interesting because I'm doing this at around about 25 millimetres a second. This line here, when I look at it, is very, very deep. I think if I change the speed, let's put the speed up to 400 and see what thickness, the, whether the line thickness changes. And let's set that back to around about 12 millimetres, which is roughly where we're talking about here, 11 or 12 millimetres. Wow, well that's down in the 0.1, maybe 0.15 region. Let's push the speed up a little bit more, maybe get up to 600 millimetres a second. I've gone quiet for a few seconds because I'm just debating something. This machine has never been any good at photo replication. Sorry I haven't brought you along for the ride, but I've just been playing off camera for about half an hour. I've made a half passable but very faint attempt at my standard test picture. I'm going to try something else now because that's an amazing result for this machine. Now trust me, we have not finished playing with lenses or beams at the moment. This is going to go on for some time I'm sure, but I've made an amazing discovery about this machine. It can do things that I never thought it could do. So although on the surface of it, this machine looks as though it's not going to be a super cutting machine after all. We look as though we're heading for failure. I say look as though we are. We haven't succeeded in failure yet. But somewhere along the way here, <laughs> I've accidentally discovered a mechanism by which this machine can do photo replication at high speed. Something my other machines cannot do, but I'd always dreamed that this machine might be able to do. But it always failed miserably because it just wasn't capable of doing this sort of work. I will catch up with you in the next session, but just take a look at this.